Yeah, there we go. <laughs> Great. All right. Thank you, everyone, for joining the RTD Accountability Committee. This is the Operations Subcommittee meeting for Wednesday, April 7th. Um, I know we have a few members of the committee that are going to be trickling in. However, I wanted to go ahead and get us started since we do have a pretty packed agenda. Um, so for members of the committee, just as a reminder, the minutes for the Finance Operations Joint Meeting from March 17th is in the packet. I, um, if there are any edits or modifications to the minutes, please do send those over to Dr. Cog's staff. I did just want to point out, I think most of you are on the Finance Committee as well, but um, there were a couple of changes that were lifted up by um, the Finance Subcommittee Chair, Rep Bridges, that will be captured. So if there's anything in addition to that, please um, let us know. Hi, Rep. Um, so for today's conversation, we're going to dedicate the majority of our time to wrapping up um, the discussion around performance measures, really focusing in on operation, the operational components of it. Um, so with that, we're going to bring on um, Tanya with North Highlands, who's going to uh, introduce us to a member of their team and then facilitate a discussion. So, hi, Tanya. Great. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Thanks for having us today. Um, we do have a slide deck prepared, but we um, intend this to be a very interactive conversation. Um, so as I mentioned a little bit earlier, we'll be taking some live notes to capture the feedback that you're providing. Um, and so, you know, we're just we're looking for a lot of participation from you all today. Um, so I'll if you can go ahead and pull up the deck. Um, but I do want to emphasize this is this is not intended to be a, a presentation um, in full. This is you know, very much a work in progress and a working session for us um, and in a way for us to uh, kind of sync up with you on um, um, where we are and um, and where we're heading. So um, I'll, I think we've got your screen up. If you could put that in presentation mode, I think we'll be ready to go. Great. So, uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks again for having us. Again, we're doing a, a discussion on performance metrics today. So um, if you could flip to the next slide, Ala, just go over the agenda. We'll do brief introductions, um, briefly recap um, our conversation um, from a couple of weeks ago, and um, then talk about the work where um, we have in progress, our approach to that. Um, and then I'm gonna sh and then I'm gonna ask Ala to take over at that point, and he's going to do um, he's gonna talk about best practice and walk through some sample metrics that we've been finding, and we will wrap up with uh, next steps. And again, that, um, that discussion of the, of the metrics, we, we, uh, that's where we intend for, for much of the interaction to be. Um, so you are already familiar with Anna and myself, um, but today we're bringing Ala Patiki uh, to join us. He is a data and analytics subject matter expert, um, very knowledgeable in all things related to data, uh, and has done, he's worked in many industries, but uh, he tends to be our go-to for transportation um, as well. So we're excited to bring his expertise uh, today. And so he'll be, he'll be uh, sharing, sharing the metrics and guiding that portion of the discussion. Also wanna give a, a, a nod to our, uh, our, our, our consultant who worked on this project as well, um, Sarah Gosling. She was unable to join us, but definitely do want to recognize um, her level of effort and work here. So thank you to Sarah. Um, and we'll go to the next slide. Just quickly, you know, want to talk about the purpose of our meeting today, and that's to review the work that we have in process, sorry, not program, in process, um, and to get your feedback um, in order to, you know, inform the development of the recommendations. Um, so we're gonna go over some sample metrics, we're gonna capture your feedback, and that is going to um, and, you know, help facilitate that actual development. So that is what we're, we're here to do today. Um, so I'll, I think, yep, so we'll touch on what we uh, talked about last time. So if you wanna go ahead and move on forward, you'll recall that you know, we just sort of level set on you know, what are performance metrics. And we talked about how it's important that they align to strategic goals and priorities, um, and that they're really, you know, a way to, um, you know, this, this approach is, a, you know, data-driven, fact-driven approach to, you know, objectively show performance. And we provided a couple of samples that we had um, sort of at the ready at the time. Um, you know, these are these are um, measurable. These are these are numbers or percentages um, that align directly to uh, a particular priority or or strategic initiatives. Um, so we talked about these two 
here um, that were from um, a recent um, uh, strategic plans from LA and SEPTA. Um, and then, Ala, if um, you would, we then talked about, you know, some, some of the themes that, you know, we're seeing around um, it, within transit on the whole um, and started asking some questions about, well, what do we mean when we talk about riders? And what, when we talk about equity, what does that look like and how do we want to measure that? Um, what, and, and then, you know, covering financial stability and, and safety and things like that. And then we went into a deeper dive discussion on, you know, what is it that RTD is here to do? Um, and so with that, um, the information that, that, and the feedback that we got from you all um, in that conversation really helped us to kind of develop the approach of our research. Um, so I think that is our next slide, Ala. Yeah, okay, great. Thank you, one more please. All right. Um, and so, you know, in addition to the themes that we, um, you know, had talked about with you all, um, you know, we, we found, we, we captured some sort of buckets, right? So knowing what's going on in the industry and knowing what's, what's important to this subcommittee, we um, you know, identified these sort of four, or I'm sorry, <laughs> four plus three equals seven, these seven um, kind of bucket areas of, um, uh, of, of performance metric interest. So there's interest in knowing how efficient and effective the operation is. Um, definitely interest um, in financial health and stability of RTP. Also customer, um, customer service, customer experience, um, very important as we uh, talk about what uh, transit looks like post COVID. Um, and we've also heard from, um, from the full accountability committee and all the subcommittees, how important it is to make sure that there is a good amount of community engagement. Um, and that you know equity and accessibility are, are important themes um, for you as well. And then um, in the last meeting, we also heard that it was important to start measuring the environmental impact that RTD has um, on the environment, particularly as it comes to funding opportunities in the future. Um, and safety is always top and, and top of mind for all transit agencies, and uh, kind of creates a creates a bucket all of its own. So uh, we look to add or are, and continue to be looking into um, th these five peer agencies on the right. Um, they were selected based on, um, you know, some knowing, knowing um, some of the, the properties that you have been looking into um, at, for best practices and the like. And also um, for uh, Utah in particular, the state of Utah um, does very, very uh, strong KPI uh, reporting and metrics. So they were a, a really useful resource. Um, so we looked at, um, you know, what, what are these? five agencies reporting and how are they reporting them. Um, so that fed a lot of the information that you're about to see that Allah's going to share with you. Um, but just want to kind of um, emphasize here that um, you know this is still a work in progress, still some research going on, um, but your feedback is going to be really important in helping us um, structure uh, these recommendations in the future. Um, so I will pause here um, and I guess just uh, I'll pause for questions. See if anybody has any questions before we turn it over to Allah and really get into the into the meat of the discussion. Okay, great, Allah. It's all it's all over to you now. Thank you, Tanya. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Hello, everybody, and uh, thank you for this opportunity. It's nice to virtually meet you, and I look forward to this uh, conversation. Um, before we dive into, uh, before we dive into looking at some metrics around the seven areas that Tanya had just walked us through, we just wanted to give you a high level around our approach and around our thinking, and hopefully it would align with your aspirations and, and where would you like to go with your metrics, uh, exercise and beyond. We recognize that at this point, we are talking about let's collect the right descriptive metrics that we can uh, that we can use to get some better visibility on how the business is performing. Of course, these metrics over time, uh, as we would like them to evolve to become maybe more diagnostic. So instead of instead of just telling us what happened, they start telling us things about like why did it happen, and then it, and then it evolves to the next level, which is to make it more predictive. 
which would tell us, okay, because of what happened and because of why it happened, here's what we think is going to happen. And then uh, the future state of, of advanced analytics is, okay, what should we do? Can we automate some decision-making that can help us take, uh, make quick decisions as a result of these analytics? And that's where uh, companies become more and more data-driven and analytics-driven and so forth. The other key point that's important to us to mention here is that everything we, we, we recommend, we will make sure that it ties to best practices and that it ties to your ultimate strategy that you're in the process of generating. Um, and then there, there's an industry movement towards producing less metrics and more dimensions. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go along. But in general, knowing what to measure and how to measure it is intended to simplify your most complex problems and tell, tell a good story around the state of, of, of uh, RTD. Uh, one key piece of our approach that we wanted to walk you through, uh, it, it's more to, to emphasize that we do a top-down approach as well as a bottom-up approach. So the top-down approach is we look at the future state. What, what does success mean to you? What does success mean to comparable agencies similar to the five that Tanya had shared? How do we prioritize those and start identifying what are the key business insights that you're trying to get answers for? It's very important that we don't just generate metrics for the sake of metrics, but rather metrics that are going to help you take action and, and, and achieve your ultimate goals. Those key insights uh, will ultimately tie to the customer journey, uh, the traveler or the rider journey. Uh, and then from that, we define the right metrics and the right dimensions that will help us slice and dice those metrics. And then we're going to show you a number of metrics in the coming slides. We're not necessarily saying that all of these metrics are, 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 in, are important for you to measure. So we would, we, we would recommend establishing a hierarchy, a prioritization of those metrics. Which ones are your most important ones? And which ones do you need if you need to go to the next level of detail? And hopefully, and in, 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 as part of the plan, all those measures should eventually feed into some form of reporting. Uh, whether we're talking about executive reporting or operational reporting that would support your business. Now, we recognize that you're in the process of also generating a strategy. What we also hope is the bottom-up approach is some of the metrics that we end up landing on should help inform building a business strategy or help building your strategic SMART uh, goals, which are specific measurable attainable relevant at time. Um, so I'll Pause here and see if there are any questions before I go to the next uh, slide. Paula, I, I wonder, you mentioned dimension. Um, would you mind explaining a bit about what, what those are? Yeah, of course. So let's say you're measuring, uh, let's say you're measuring ridership. You're measuring, so the metric is how many people have gone through, an ex, have, have gone through a trip or, or have gone through a route. Well, one dimension is looking at those, at that metric over time, like how many people rode over time. Or another dimension is by location. Where are the, where's the point of origin for these riders? Or another one was by, by the number of stops that they've made or the number of transfers. Those are all similar dimensions to the same metric that we're talking about. Does that help uh, Tanya and team? Yes. yes. Um, so this is Dea, and then Rhett, I see you've got your hand ra raised. Um, so Ala, I just want to make sure I understand the dim dimensions. So it sounds like really what we're trying to do is find the right metric to tell the right story about how RTD is operating in the community. So if I, if route, I don't know, 15 is being, it has like consistently shows that it's been written, I don't know, millions of times over the last year, we're really yeah. trying to just assess what that performance looks like from a couple of different angles. Is that, is that right? Am that's, I understanding that right? Okay. That's exactly right. So we okay. want to see why are people going more on route 15 or, or, or trip mm -hmm. uh, 15? Is it, are they, are they coming from the same destination and going to the same, or they come from the same origination going to the same destination? Is it the same customer segment that's riding are, are they repeat customers or what single, single fare customers, 
Are they customers that are buying day tickets or are they buying monthly tickets? So all these are dimensions that they were trying to analyze the metric that you just mentioned. Does it, so yes. Okay. Um, Brett, I did see that you had your hand raised and you're on mute. Oh, you're still on mute. <laughs> So I was uh, curious about the dimensions because I've, I've seen that issue before, but when you're, when you're talking about ridership, you're not talking about people. You're talking about people that step onto the bus and they may have gotten off another bus before, but it's, it's that event that triggers your ridership counts. And so it, unless you can identify who got on the bus somehow, you don't know how many, uh, how many buses they had to get on or trains they had to get on in order to get to where they were going. And, uh, and the other issue is, is when you say when, you could say what day, or you could say what time of day, and you could differentiate whether it was a holiday or whether it was a weekend day. And so if you're averaging weekday ridership, which is a pretty common thing to do, you've got to be able to eliminate the holidays and then there are regular federal holidays, and then there are holidays that may be not taken by every group. So it, it, all these things are, you know, it's easy to say dimensions. It's, it's really hard unless you are precise in how you nail those, those things down, because you can get some odd results if you can. And then how far their trip was, how long, how long they traveled. So it's got to be integrated with other kinds of data. I don't know with you know how fine grain our measurements are of all of those different things but it would be interesting uh if someone from rtd could speak to uh how many how much of the count of ridership is based on automated systems that don't necessarily know who's riding and how many of them actually capture who the rider is so this is deborah johnson a common place in the transit industry we use what are called automatic passenger counters uh, they can be on bus, bus and rail. And for all intents and purposes, we qualify it as a boarding. So it doesn't necessarily mean it's a round trip. And so there are actual people going on and you could use, you know, uh, uh, intraviolet, you know, lights that detect there's somebody's moving that's been in band. So you can actually, you know, visualize someone's head as opposed to just seeing a briefcase, which may not capture someone. And another way in which that's doing, uh, which is done as well, sort of as a checks and balances as a sampling in what we call ride checks, where you may have somebody go out, sample the route, and based upon, you know, the headways and the service delivery and things of the like, you can garner the ridership. Yeah, that's tough. The, the, the fine grain, who it, who it was and how many connections they made may not be a statistic that's available to us then. It may not unless you're using some aspect whereby you're using, um, technology relative to using like mobile-based ticketing or something of the like where you tap and you're using data analytics, but that's not a guarantee either because if you're in range and you have a cell phone and you have something, a ticket, it could be captured in close proximity as well. So there's a lot of things that are evolving as we look at intelligent transportation systems. Is that level of information currently captured? Not for us, no. Is it a privacy issue or just we haven't gotten around to it? Well, there's a couple of privacy issues if in fact you choose to disclose that. I mean, just like when you use smart card technology, you can't use it for other reasons if somebody registers their card. So there are privacy issues around that. Um, the whole aspect of the mobile ticketing market is relatively new. Having experimented this with this other places, um, it, it hasn't evolved, it hasn't matured to that point in time yet where we could actively utilize it. And then not to mention, if you were to get off the bus and another bus passed you, you could be captured as well. Right, yeah. Yeah. I, so I do have another quick question and then I'll, I'll let you all move forward. I'll, uh, and I think this will come up in, a, in the conversation as we move forward, but I, I am kind of curious as we look at different dimensions, how do we, or how might we get to some of the climate and air quality and more of the environmental pieces? Cause a lot of this seems to be focused on or potentially focus on, of course, the writer experience, and rightfully so, but I also want us to kind of hold 
our, our other objective and making sure that we are centering this, the environment um, and those outcomes as part of this conversation as well. So I, I just thank, want thank to add you, that. Dia. Thank you, Dia. Yeah, uh, this example that I just gave that started this conversation, you're right, was around ridership. But yes, environmental impact is one of the seven pieces. And, and yes, we do have some metrics there. Um, regarding regarding how deep we go in measuring environmental sustainability and, and all of that will 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 as similar to the conversation that Deborah is mentioning will 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 depend on what data do you have today how much uh, worth of time would you like to invest in pulling data that you don't have today and then what type of technology do, does RTD have as part of the infrastructure to track uh, you know, from a sensor, from an IoT perspective, uh, CO2 levels and carbon footprint and noise, noise levels and, 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 and so forth. Uh, but definitely it, it's something that would be prioritized based on a conversation with you and how important does it feel. And that's where the step number five here is, is key, which is to, to make sure that we prioritize based on the proper hierarchy that suits you, not what we would be recommending alone. Um, does, that, does that answer, Dia? It does, yes. And then, Rhett, just a, a quick point. I totally agree with you. Uh, and just my point on customer segmentation was just one dimension, which I agree. If we're looking at ridership and it's not tracking that type of demographics, and that type of detail, I was looking at it from a digital customer experience perspective, but then we would look at the other dimensions that you had mentioned in your conversations, such as time, and, and time can go in so many ways, such as location, such as route, such as uh, who's the vehicle driver, such as if there was a, a, a breakdown or an accident during those trips or not, such as the duration of the trip or the cost of fare. So yes, uh, I, I follow your thought and I definitely understand also the security ramifications that we need to be very careful of. Thank you for sharing that. I think I'll, uh, I'll jump in real quickly to say, um, this is your slide here, I appreciate it very much, and I hope the committee does, um, is meant to be really sort of foundational setting for what are metrics, how can they be used, how are they established, those sorts of things. But yeah. obviously, through this exercise, um, we're not expecting to build the full suite of waterfall metrics that go from the highest level to the lowest level through the organization that waterfall through every operational entity to talk about ways to get to more efficient and effective services in the operational units, right? That, that would be, I mean, RTD already has some things underway um, and that's really for them to do. This is looking at the high level, but setting up the foundation yeah. for how the high level ties to the rest. Agreed, agreed. And I'll, I'll actually share with you that, that more relevant content uh, by each one of those sub uh, me measures. So if we, if, yes. So if we take the first one, which is operational effectiveness and efficiency, um, we, we put on the right side, some prompting que probing questions for us to start the conversation, because we definitely want to pick your brain before we, we stick a list of measures in front of you, uh, of what we, what we have pulled from our research, but as it relates to, you know, are we able to, to grow ridership? What are some of the metrics that you'd be interested in? Uh, can you share with us just out loud, think out loud? And I know we've already covered some of those. What are some of those metrics? And I'll just go down this list of probing questions. Um, from a customer, from a service perspective, how dependable and consistent is our service that RTD provides? And then how reliable is our fleet and infrastructure? So I was, I was hoping if maybe we have a, just a couple of minutes worth of a conversation where you could th think of uh, what are some of the measures that you would like to see to help us answer such questions. And I'll pause now. And I know we tend to be a little formal in this group. So I would almost suggest for members of the committee, feel free to just unmute yourself and we're gonna do a little bit more of a, an, what might feel uncomfortable popcorn style. <laughs> um, 
So please just offer it up. Um, Rhett, I see you've got your hand raised. As always. You know, I really <laughs> object to this term ridership. It's boardings that we measure. We have no idea what the ridership is. Mm -hmm. We don't know how many people got on and got off. All we know is how many people boarded the vehicle. Mm -hmm. So for starters, I think definition of terms really matters. We'll, we'll, we'll make that change, Rhett. Thank you. This is Kristen. How is the question, how dependable and consistent is our service going to be measured? Mm. Is it going to be anecdotal? Is it going to be, are we going to follow each individual vehicle to see what the, the time is on their MVC, uh, which is their, um, basically the, the iPad that the drivers use, that that's going to be, how is that question going to be answered? There are some sample metrics on the next slide that might help you think through oh, that a little bit. Thank you. So I think that's a great question. I jumped, I jumped in too early, Tanya, I apologize. No, perfect, perfect. No, to give you an example uh, for, that, for that particular one, Kristen, like what is the percentage of on time performance. Uh, I don't know if you track that today. I believe you do. Uh, that would be an example. Or what percentage of time is is your service available versus down? Um, mm -hmm. Another one we captured is uh, per percentage of adherence to service start time. Uh, how many? How often are there delays versus not? Excuse me, may I ask a quick question in reference to what you just said, Allah? So when you talk about start time, are you talking about off the lot? Because basically there's certain nuances involved with that. So that's getting back to Rudd's point about words matter, because basically when an operator picks up his or her paddle and they leave the yard, that is the pivotal point because they need to meet their first time point, which could be the generator for on-time performance. And within the reference of on-time performance, as I said at the last meeting, that could be a minute early or five minutes late. So that brought me full circle as we were as we talk about customer satisfaction, because as it relates to OTP, you could be on time, but if five minutes late impacts me being to where I need to be, then on-time performance is a meaningless measurement. So I just wanted to qualify. I'm not trying to put you on the spot or dispute what you're saying, but I think for everybody's edification to the point that Kristen asked, you know, how dependable and consistent is our service? As I shared with my team, we could have the best on-time performance in the world and have all the time points, but if it doesn't meet the needs of the customers, then what difference does it make? So I think that's something that we should be cognizant of. So thanks. Thanks, Deborah. And how do you, again, determine the need of the customer and how it relates to uh, the on-time performance again? Do you, can you share a little bit more around that? Okay, so what I'm saying is when we talk about on-time performance from the perspective of delivering service, when we qualify on-time performance, that means let's take, for example, 8 a.m. a bus or a rail car is supposed to be somewhere. If it got there at 7.59 or if it got there at 8.05, that's technically still on time. For all intents and purposes, you have a six minute window. And what I'm saying is when we talk about customer experience, if I needed to be somewhere at 8.15 and I'm doing a 10 minute ride and the bus showed up at 8.05, I'm going to get there at 8.21. So even though technically we adhere to our on-time performance metric, I as a customer did not get where I needed to get when I needed to get there. I get it. I get it. Yeah. Um, um, I just want to draw our attention to time here pretty quickly. So um, I know we had originally planned to have those sort of probing questions up front, but I think it might make more sense for us to kind of head through these slides and the different buckets that we have so that um, we can kind of make sure we hit on all of the topics we have today. Yeah, I could do that, Tanya. I want to make sure I, I respond to, to the thought that you just shared, Deborah. Um, I agree. I think that's where we need to be careful which metrics are we looking at and what what are we what question are we trying to answer so in the context that you had shared i agree with you 100% looking at percent of on time performance is not indicative of a good customer experience but rather just indicative of the operational uh, stability or dependability of the service but then 
under customer experience, we need to have metrics that are soliciting customer feedback around their uh, satisfaction or lack of satisfaction with being able to, uh, to, 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 to deliver a trip that is to their satisfaction, which I'm not saying that we have it fully covered today. I think it's something that we, our team needs to note and make sure that we address. I appreciate that wholeheartedly. Thank you for you know addressing that. And I agree, it's about customer satisfaction, not customer service, because you could have stellar customer service and still not satisfy the customer. And yep. we want them to be our promoters mm -hmm. and end up with a net promoter score that makes us you know an optimal transit service uh, agency. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, and, and it's how we need to define the metric and how we need to ensure that a particular insight can sometimes be a combination of metrics not one uh, mm -hmm. and it needs to tie to the goal that Deborah you you had in mind so thank you for sharing yeah um, and just to lift up really quickly and I, I also want to be cognizant of time I mean a lot of these metrics just as a reminder to the committee are certainly things that we had we have had at least what we see right now in terms of operational effectiveness we've talked about in terms of not only effectiveness but efficiency and what does that really mean and look like um so i, I will acknowledge I, I am glad to see at least fleet reliability as part of that conversation as well jackie i see that you unmuted yourself yeah what just one of the th thanks daya one of the things that i don't see here and looking through the list of the other performance metrics not sure where it fits is one of the issues that rtt has had is actually having having uh, operators and drivers and so I, I think that needs to be part of operational effectiveness is that maintaining an adequate staffing level and an adequately trained staff. So wondering where that may fit in. So, you know, I would suggest that we quickly um, sort of pause and run through all of the buckets and the measures that we came up with as leading measures from, um, as was mentioned previously, the survey of other leading properties. Um, obviously, we would not suggest that the full suite of measures that we've got on these slides be um, adopted. That would be far too many. You know, they say what gets measured gets done, but you can't do everything all at once. Um, so this is really the examples from best practice um, and like properties. So maybe if we run through all of them, then um, rather quickly, then we can circle back and get your feedback on what resonates most and what you think is most important. Thanks, Anna. Uh, and just uh, to, to, to just dis describe, you're seeing things in a blue font. I apologize at the bottom of the screen, you don't, it doesn't show what this means. The blue font are metrics that we saw uh, available in some of the RTD board reports that have been delivered. So I'll go to the next one. Uh, our next one is financial performance. So questions we're, we're trying to, we would like to consider are, how do we know that our operating revenue is appropriate? Uh, how do we gauge the efficiency of our operating costs? Do we produce comprehensive and timely financial reporting? Are employers participating in the transportation pre-tax benefit program? And what is the credit worthiness of our agency, for example, bond rating? Those are some of the questions that we wanted just to identify to give you an idea. And then when we go to the specific metrics around those questions, we've identified me metrics that fall under financial measurements and other financial indicators. And you could see some of them that I'm sure resonate with you uh, that you've come across or, or interacted with. In, in today's world. The next one to share with you is around customer experience. And this is where we ask ourselves, how do we know if customers are satisfied with and will fix the ridership experience, the fair purchasing experience and the post-trip experience? How do we capture their interactions and feedback? So somewhat to what we were talking about earlier, uh, Deborah. And how, it, how is the call center performing? So some of those metrics are uh, percent of time passengers are in crowded conditions because we know how sensitivity is, is key to, to, uh, to our current world that we live in with COVID-19. 
Um, and then any type of complaints and compliments and, uh, and uh, any type of overdue cleaning that needs to happen are some examples that we've identified. From a call, call center perspective, call answer rate efficiencies, what percentage are of issues are resolved within the first call and, and, and so, so forth. How many complaints per boarding are some of the other examples that we've identified. We then go into community engagement. Uh, how does RTD engage with the community and how do we know that this engagement is sufficient and positively impacting the community? Um, so this is where we look at things like the number of partnerships with local governments, uh, any civic engagement presentations, which we know is, is part of what you do already, uh, positive contributions to the region and percent increase in positive public impressions uh, through different medias of communication. Can I just ask a, a quick clarifying question on this one? So the number of partnerships with local governments, can, what does that mean exactly? Is that based on IGA agreements or what, what exactly is that metric? Sure, and I would probably check with Anna. Anna, if, uh, if you have any thoughts on this particular one, because I know that's something that you have seen in other uh, agencies. Yeah, so this would be, um, and I can't recall which of the properties this came from, but how um, much the different authorities or agencies are aligned um, to provide excellent customer service, right? In the Northeast, um, this could get at whether, for instance, New Jersey Transit and SEPTA, Port Authority, um, New York, New Jersey, the PATH, and MTA are all in full agreement um, and and um, and working together around um, transfers, timing, and ticketing. In other places, it could simply be, you know, whether you have the support of um, the local entities from a revenue and taxing perspective. Does that help, Dia? Uh, yes, that helps. Thank you. Um, and, and then we go to equity and accessibility. And, and this is where, how does RTD ensure it is appropriately serving vulnerable populations? And how does RTD provide a fair and impartial transportation service? And the way we, we, we uh, describe this in the, in the two buckets under equity and accessibility, which is serving all populations when we think of equity and then servicing all customers when we think of accessibility. Um, things like percentage of minority and low income people with access to system or percentage of households within a 10 minute walk or a role of high quality mobility options. Now I do recognize that with this with the second one, there are things that are not as easy to measure. So we, we would need to be realistic and with what we have available in order to, to determine if this metric is viable or not, of course. Uh, from a servicing all customers, so like on-time performance and adherence to zero denials for service requests and, and, any, and, and, and tracking closely any ADA complaints, complaints uh, per boarding. I do just want to lift up really quickly a comment at the very end or, uh, that was lifted up by Crystal Murillo. Um, that I think might be something at least worth considering in this, this section around um, really lifting up equity, equity neighborhoods, equity populations and how they're, how they are being served. Um, and if that's something at least worth considering, again, speaking to the value of this, uh, values of this committee and really um, serving equity populations. Thank you. The, uh, the sixth uh, area is around environmental impact and then what, what measures should we be um, tracking, whether it's pound of seasonal air pollutants prevented or uh, CO2 per passenger miles traveled, uh, total facility energy use and the, and the use of 
renewable energy as well and, and, and sustainable energy, uh, percent of low emission vehicles in fleet, uh, to name a few. I did just, uh, Brett, I see you have your hand raised. This is, this is also a, a function of how many people are on the bus. If, if you wanna look at how much you're saving and you got a 40 foot bus with one person on it, or you got a 40 foot bus with you know, 50 people on it, it's a very different measurement. And it, every vehicle has, has its own characteristics. So you've really gotta, you've gotta have some pretty sophisticated data going into this and then be able to match that data to what your actual boardings and ridership are in these, on these buses. So some of this stuff's really hard. You know, you, the, the stuff about how many miles away you are, how many, what's a 10 minute walk, even that's a function of age. You know, it's, it's complicated. You have to know where people live. In a lot of cases, you don't know that. So, yeah. Uh, I hate, track I hate today, these right? kind of sloppy, you know, positive comments and impact on the community. Stuff is really a, a tough thing to measure with any accuracy. There is software that can look at, at, uh, at either Twitters or messages and things like that and measure how many bad words they see or how many negative words they see and things like that. You can do that analytically. Some of the others are much harder to nail down. Mm -hmm. Elise, I see that you've unmuted yourself. Well, I just wanted to make sure I, the seasonal air pollutant prevented. I don't know if that was supposed to be a nod towards ozone non-attainment, but there wouldn't be CO2 emissions per se. So I, I was a little confused by that. I think climate change and ozone are two of the big drivers, so to speak, um, around transit um, benefit to the region environmentally that we'd want to be able to um, measure. Thank you. Yeah, this is certainly um, kind of an ideal state. We would be able to capture all of these things, um, you know, sort of the, the art of the possible, um, but needing to make sure that it's it's realistic and, and achievable. Um, yeah. Well, Rudd's point about how complicated is true, and yet I know that all of these things are modeled um, by CDOT and by the Air Quality Control Commission to give credit. So at some level, you, you, you can get credit for some of these environmental benefits, even if it's some, you're making estimates around assumptions and you need to be transparent about them. But these, these things are measured now for better or worse. They're at a better or worse level. I guess I'm curious if these are measured, so these are measured by the state, but to what extent do they, does it, I guess, roll down to RTD? Um, I don't know, Elise, if you know that, or, and, and I'm looking specifically at like some of these other metrics that I know the state currently captures. I, are you familiar with that, Elise, not to put you on the spot? Um, I, I know that the, the that, um, the CDOT is an updating of rule now, and it'll be adopted sometime this summer by the Air Quality Control Commission to do modeling around transportation, um, GHG emissions. Mm -hmm. So that is done at some level now. It will be done much in a much finer level going forward. Um, and 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 the facility energy use and the, the vehicles in the fleet, that's a easy, those are pretty easy. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know, am I? Am, yeah. I think that the, the two metrics that I made, that I mentioned are measured now at either a, the Air Pollution Control Division or CDOT. Mm -hmm. Got it. Thank you, thank you. If I may um, just share with you the last uh, set of me metrics, if that's okay, uh, mm -hmm. and then we'll open it to more questions. Um, so from a safety perspective, we look at you know system safety, employee safety, and system security are some of the uh, buckets of, of measurements that we've identified. And you can see on the screen, this is not n intended to be a complete list, uh, but this is some of the predominant measures that we've we've captured from our 
research and from the work that we've done with, with some of the other agencies. Mm -hmm. One thing, if, if I could just lift this up, and this is a, a personal concern as we look at this. My, when I look at safety, I want us to be really cognizant of how equity shows up and specifically racial equity and that we aren't necessarily targeting um, black, brown or, or individuals of color. And so I, I wanna be really mindful of how that shows up as a safety metric. Um, and I don't know if you all have any, uh, any thoughts on how maybe other transit agencies may be moving away from certain metrics in, in acknowledgement that um, typically folks may be targeted um, because of their race or ethnicity. So I, I just want to acknowledge that. And I don't know, Ala or Tanya, if you all have any um, insights. Let's go ahead, Tanya. Sure, thanks. Um, in, in the uh, properties that we've benchmarked thus far, we have not seen any measures related to that. Um, does not mean that, you know, we, we can't try and, you know, brainstorm and see, do some further digging and some, some further research to see um, if we can find something. And we certainly do re recognize the sensitivity and, and understand the question very well. So thank you for bringing that up. Um, and that I believe would conclude, but then we had a couple of, you know, additional questions or metrics around purchasing and procurement, around workforce, around economic impact that we didn't necessarily find the right bucket of the seven to place. So we just had another other, if I may say, for lack of a better word, bucket uh, to, to place those just for us to reference. And again, through the props, mm -hmm. through the exercise, we would identify what is uh, important versus not important to you based on our conversations with yeah. you. So really quick, because I do want to acknowledge that, um, unfortunately, we are going to get kicked out of this Zoom room <laughs> um, for the Dr. Cog meeting at uh, five till, and we also had one other item to cover. What I do want to share, and this is a reflection of just the conversations, um, if you wouldn't mind going back one slide, um, a reflection of the conversations that have been had by this committee, uh, workforce, employee engagement, I, I would like to somehow lift that up again, just bringing back into this conversation um, a lot of the work that's already happening within RTD around employee just satisfaction and things that were lifted up in the state auditor report. So I, I'm, I, I just want to lift that up as a conversation that's already been had in the committee. I don't know what that metric looks like. I don't know if it's this employee engagement score or something else, but again, just lifting that up um, as a point of conversation that we've had. Um, and I don't know if there's anything else that maybe a committee member wants to lift up before I, I move us towards at least transitioning out of this portion of the conversation and next steps. Okay, I acknowledge we went through this kind of quick um, and not a lot of time to digest the, the metrics themselves, but if there are specific items, what I'm gonna request of the committee is that you all please send that to um, the Dr. Cog team and myself, just so that we can track this as we start to build out the potential recommendation um, in terms of the dashboard uh, or in terms of the, the transparency um, dashboard. So I wanna thank Tanya and Ala for just presenting that. I'm assuming we'll get the presentation. I didn't see it in the packet. We'll get the presentation afterwards, is that correct? Yes, absolutely. Sure. And so any feedback you all have in terms of, you know, maybe what, out, out of these areas, what are the most important? We can take a deeper dive in on those. Um, you know, we got some great feedback today, but if we could, um, you know, maybe kind of confirm what, what those are and we can, you know, work on creating, you know, two to three very strong um, metrics for those areas. Great. Um, again, this is building on the work of this committee and uh, conversations that we've had multiple times. Uh, one thing that I do want to lift up again as the work of this committee that we we are certainly taking into account as part of this metric. Um, we've had a number of conversations around fares and past structures and again just formulating a recommendation um, from this committee so that is forthcoming. We wanted to have this conversation around metrics because again there is a relationship between these two uh, or between the two um, uh, pieces of work so I wanted to just lift that up 
Um, I also wanted to share that um, it seems like a couple of folks from Boulder County had a few recommendations in terms of the pass and, and fair structure recommendations for this committee to just consider. Um, so I did want to just open it up for a quick comment because I, I do want the public to just be aware of this. Um, so Alex, I think you had um, a quick recommendation or something that you'd like to bring to this committee for consideration. Yeah. Thank you, Dea. Um, this is Alex Hydright, Senior Transportation Planner with Boulder County. Um, we've been closely following the conversations with the Accountability Committee about the fair structure um, and past programs and wanted to provide a couple ideas that we've been thinking about, um, put them forward as much uh, as a starting point for conversation as um, ideas that could be implemented verbatim. Um, but basically, trying to distill some of the things that we've heard from this committee um, with a goal for the fairs and um, past programs uh, with a couple goals that I think we've heard of rebuilding ridership post-COVID, a focus on equity, um, simplifying the fair structure and past programs, um, having the fairs be fair, expediting the boarding process, and then providing stable revenue to RTD. Um, so with kind of those overarching goals in mind, a couple um, quick and potentially provocative ideas, um, sort of intended as conversation starters. Um, on the fair side, um, an idea would be to replace the local and regional fare with a single uh, low flat fare, um, potentially a dollar or two. Um, so basically abolish the regional fare structure um, and leave the airport fare, uh, leave the airport fare zone sort of as is recognizing that on a daily basis, most folks don't interact with the airport. Um, and so that's not going to cause too much confusion to have two different uh, fare zones. Um, and then strongly financially incentivize the non-cash fare. So if you pay with mobile or my ride, et cetera, um, the, the price would be lower per boarding. And then couple that with a big expansion in the number of retail locations where you could purchase my ride cards um, to address some of the equity concerns. Um, and then for the discount fares, um, a somewhat provocative idea to go ahead and make all of the discounts fare free. So if you are a youth up to age 19, if you're a senior 65 or older, um, or if you qualify for the LIV program, just abolish the fare completely. Um, this would address some of the um, concerns and confusion, particularly in the LIV program, about different ways of paying for the fare. Is just once you have your LIV ID card, that's your ticket to ride, and you don't need to worry about the fare because it's fare free. Um, and so um, to, to pay for a lot of those things, which obviously um, by themselves would lead to a large reduction in fare revenue for RTD, um, on the flip side, start charging for parking um, and start charging for parking in the first 24 hours for all parkers, including in district vehicles um, and start charging a lot more for parking. And so potentially $5 a day, um, right from the first 24 hours, if you're an in-district parker, maybe $8 a day, if you're an out of district parker um, for the closer in lots and then for the lots that are currently free, um, charge a lower rate, but still charge everybody for all parking at RTD. Um, so basically shift more of the fair revenue from RTD away from transit passengers and more um, towards people who are also parking a vehicle at RTD facilities, recognizing that cost of those. And then also um, as a way to offset the reduction in fair revenue from some of the fair ideas. Um, then on the pass side, um, keep the existing day pass, monthly pass options, um, introduce fare <laughs> accumulators or fare cappers, um, keep the existing eco pass system, but simplify the SLAs um, a bit and then create a new sort of pay-as-you-go structure um, for organizations that want to purchase monthly passes. So if you're an organization and 10% of your folks want to ride transit, EcoPass probably doesn't make sense because you have to pay for it for everyone, but create a new, um, new pay-as-you-go option where businesses, um, neighborhoods, communities, um, housing authorities, et cetera, could purchase monthly passes for just the folks that need it um, and then be able to distribute those monthly passes through MyRide or mobile um, and, uh, and create, a, create an option that works for, for organizations that have um, smaller percentages of folks that want to ride transit. Um, um, I am sorry to cut you off, Alex, but I, I do want to thank you for the comments. Um, I 